Welcome to another English language A-level video with me Paul here from the QE and on this one we're going to have a think about children's language development. It's a taster session so this is useful for you if you're a year 11 student who's considering hmm shall I take English language A-level? How is it different from GCSE? Answer a lot and it could be useful for you as well if you're a first year student going into your second year and you haven't done children's language development yet. Okay, so let's start off with this question. How does a child's language go from this to, shut up, to this? Here, have you seen the bouncy ball of mine with stars on it and unicorns? Now that is quite a remarkable transformation, this everyday miracle of how a seven-month-old babbling and cooing turns into a five-year-old constructing lavish standard sentences with a rich vocabulary. So there are all sorts of theories about how this happens and I'm going to uh, give you four of them and what you need to do is rank them. So how effective do you think these explanations are of how children learn speech. So one being perfect, that seems to sum it up perfectly, and four being nah. Right, explanation one, copycats. Children learn language through copying, through imitation. It's as simple as that. Their language learning, it's shaped by the adults around them who give them positive and negative reinforcement. So children listen, they imitate what adults say and of course parents encourage and reward the correct language forms by answering their questions or um, responding to their requests and they discourage and punish the use of language which is considered unacceptable or wrong so they'll ignore them or they'll misunderstand them or they won't get that orange juice from the fridge so children are essentially copycats Explanation number two, hardwired. So this is the idea that language is hardwired into the brain and that humans have this naturally programmed ability to work out the systems of a language grammar. So it's built into the brain in the same way as the body, you know, the capacity to walk, for example, or hitting puberty is built into the human body. And so the argument goes, that's why children across the world acquire language following the same sequence. So in the same stages, you know, starting off with, with cooing and babbling, then going into the so-called holophrastic stage, which is the one word utterance stage, two word utterances, telegraphic speech, post telegraphic speech. So it doesn't matter if you're speaking Hungarian or Mandarin Chinese, or English, you're likely to be going through the same stages at roughly the same rate. So language is hardwired into the brain and these developmental milestones are innate. So long as a child is in normal conditions, exposed to language around them, they will naturally pick it up. Explanation number three, makes you think. This is the idea that children's language skills completely depend upon their levels of thinking, their thought levels. So humans can only start using language when actually their thinking levels have achieved certain stages. So you need the certain knowledge or understanding in order to articulate some of those ideas. Take, for example, verb tenses. You know, the child has to have some capacity for understanding the difference between present tense and past tense before they can start to use those language features and similarly sizes and positions of things. Makes you think. And lastly, interactivity. This is the idea that children can really only develop language successfully through participating in social situations. So what happens is that the carers, the adults around them, they modify their language so that they're questioning and encouraging and supporting the child through scaffolding. And that's the most important factor in developing speech. OK, so four explanations. What do you think? So we started off with the idea of copycats. 
This is behaviorism, the idea that children are just copying, imitating adults around them. And this was first put forward in the 1950s by an American psychologist called the Big Friendly Skinner. We then have the idea of language being hardwired. This is nativism. So this was first argued by Noam Chomsky, also American, back in the 1950s. We then have the cognitive theory that language depends upon your sequence of thought processes. So this is associated most of all with the Swiss theorist Jean Piaget. And then finally, hidden behind my head here, we have interactivity. So this is the social interactionist theory with the theorist Jerome Bruner, the interactivity, learning language in social situations is the key to language learning. So what do you think are some of the strengths and some of the limitations of all of those theories? Have a think about them. And obviously on the course, on the CLD course, we will be going in quite a lot of depth thinking about the, the benefits and the limitations of those as explanations for CLD. Now, obviously you have to test out research ideas and we mentioned there about Chomsky and his nativist ideas. So here's an interesting test that a researcher called Jean Burko came up with. And this is a WUG. Okay, so this is the famous WUG test, which has been around for decades, which actually first came up with in 1958. Okay, so I am now going to inflict upon you the WUG test. So have a look at the next few slides and write down on a piece of paper the answers. Are you sitting comfortably? Then we shall begin. Number one. This is a WUG. And this is another one. There are two of them. There are two. This is a Gutch. Now there's another one. There are two of them. There are two. Number three. Now this dog has quirks on him. And that dog has more quirks on him. That dog is... And this dog has even more quirks on him. This dog is the... This is a man who knows how to rick. He's ricking. He did the same thing yesterday. What did he do yesterday? Yesterday, he... Now, this is a worker who owns a hat. Whose hat is it? It is the hat. Number seven, this is a man who knows how to luge. He is luging. He does it every day. Every day he... What would you call a man whose job is to zib? A... And this is a man who knows how to zib. What's he doing? He is... And finally, this is a very tiny wug. What would you call a very tiny wug? A. Okay, now, hopefully, you filled in those gaps. And I'm expecting that you're putting these sorts of answers. Number one, wugs. Two, gutches. Three, quirkier. Four, quirkiest. Five, ricked. Six wugs with a possessive apostrophe in there, seven luges, eight zibber, nine zibbing, and who knows what you got for number ten? Possibly you got wugglers, maybe it was a wuggling, maybe you've got some other variations on that. This is the wug test. Now, 
what's the point of it? So how might this test explain how children acquire language? Let's have a think about that. What's the point of the test? While you're thinking about that, have a look at a five-year-old in the 1970s doing this test. This is a line. Now there's another one. There are two of them. Are two. To illustrate that what the child has learned is a grammar and not a huge memory bank of phrases, Jean Gleason invented a test called the WUG test. This test shows how children can apply the rules of their language, even to nonsense words that they could never have heard before. Now there's another one. There are two of them. There are two words. Right. Oh, look at this funny one. This is a man who knows how to bod. He's bodding. He did the same thing yesterday. What did he do yesterday? Yesterday he... Bodded. Bodded, right. This is a gutch. Now there's another one. There are two of them. There are two guts. <laughs> this is a bit who owns a hat. Whose hat is it? It is the deck. Now there are two bits. They both own hats. Whose hats are they? They are the deck. Okay, so the word test, as I say, created a long time ago by Jean Berkey Gleason. And um, Basically, the point is that children, it shows that children have a much more sophisticated understanding of grammar than they have been taught explicitly. So the point about it is that it uses pseudo words, made up words like wug, to ensure that the child has never been exposed to the word previously. And in the research undertaken, a load of four-year-olds, three quarters of them were able to deduce what the plural of the noun wug was. So these results seem to suggest that children have an ability to understand grammatical rules and transfer them to other examples that they've never heard before. And therefore, if you think back to our four explanations about children's language acquisition, this seems to support Chomsky's idea of nativist theory, that language is kind of hardwired into the brain. OK, so now let's move on to some actual recordings and transcripts of uh, children speaking. Uh, this is taken from a uh, training that I went on on the English Media Centre. And we have got a very short clip here between a grandma and a little girl who's two and a half years old called Leone. So I'm going to play you it in a minute. And what you need to do is you need to look for evidence that either supports or challenges the theories that we talked about so far. So behaviorism, the idea that children are merely imitating adults. They just copy them and adults positively and negatively reinforce. So that's behaviorism. As opposed to nativism, this is the idea that children naturally work out the rules of grammar. Thirdly, uh, cognitive theory. So children's language can only reflect their thinking levels. And then finally, social interactionism. So carers carefully modify their language and children um, learn through being in social situations. So let's just watch the very beginning of this and what evidence are you seeing that either supports or challenges these theories. Okay, I'll pause it there. So pr the audio on that probably wasn't very good for you to be hearing. Um, but let's just look at the, the very opening to that interaction. 
So what evidence are you finding that supports this idea of behaviorism, nativism, cognitive theory, and social interactionism? So grandma says, is that his head? And Leone says, yeah, there we make a snake. So grandma says, okay, can you make his beak? What does his beak look like? And then Leone says, oh, uh, and then there's a bit that's indistinct and says, got, uh, he got a beak, a beak. And grandma goes, hmm, like that. Okay, so we've got plenty of uh, evidence here of social interactionism, haven't we? The, the grandma is using questions. There are three of them, actually, in this very short excerpt uh, that require responses from Leone. Uh, a couple of them informational questions and one of them actually a request. So this is evidence of social interactionism, that this child would not be uh, using sentences in this way had not been for the grandmother's questions that she's posing. Uh, we also have some evidence of nativism because if you look at this bit here where Leone seems to be trying to figure out how to construct the sentence, it is evidence that she's not just copying her grandmother's sentences at all, that she's trying to use language in a creative way. We have plenty of behaviorism as well. I mean, take this noun beak. So Leone copies the noun beak after the grandmother has said it twice, and the grandmother positively reinforces Leone's utterances at the end there with that nonverbal hmm at the end. And then we've got cognitive theory. So in order for this conversation to actually work, Leone clearly has to understand the, the body parts of the animals, and she has to understand the idea of a beak before she can word, use that word in an effective way. So even in this very short excerpt that we've looked at here, we're seeing some supporting evidence that actually backs up you know, quite a few of these, uh, of these theories. Now, if you were in my class, I would be getting you to be looking at the whole of the transcript in a lot of detail, and I'd be getting you to answer the question, what does the Leone recording demonstrate about how and why children acquire language? And I would help you by giving you possible paragraph starters that are based around these different theories. So from a behaviourist perspective, Leone's language shows evidence of imitation in response to positive reinforcement. Uh, nativists might argue that Leone is developing her language naturally and creatively. She's not just copying. The transcript demonstrates the importance of understanding and knowledge before the child can successfully use language. The social interaction in the transcript is crucial to Leone's developing language skills. OK, so the important thing on this is that you're not just going to be learning concepts around children's language development, but you're going to be putting your conceptual theoretical knowledge into practice with some real life messy data in front of you, which won't necessarily back up, won't necessarily support a lot of the theories that you've been learn learning about. OK, so from our short video here, there are a few takeaway points that I want you to come away from this with. What are the four theories of language acquisition that we talked about earlier on related to these four pictures? What do you remember about the word test? And what do you think is the significance of this very simple piece of research? And then finally, what did you learn from the very brief Leone clip and transcript that we looked at together? That's given you a little bit of a taster on CLD speech. Bear in mind that in terms of CLD, we also look at CLD writing, so the development of children's literacy over time. And this is just one unit amongst many on this fantastic course, because we look at how and why language changes over time. So language change, which incidentally includes international forms of English, where we look at Singaporean and Indian English, for example, and see how they developed over time. We look at language diversity, so the various uh, sociolinguistic factors which are having an influence on language, with where we look at the research done on gender, on age, on social class. So fascinating area of the course. And another area that we look at is language discourses. So
So this is discussions and debates that people have about language. Now add to that your original writing, where you're going off and constructing pieces of narrative fiction, short story writing, and also uh, persuasive writing, where you're writing speeches and journalistic articles of a persuasive nature. And of course, in the second year, you will also be doing a language investigation where you do a full two month project on a particular aspect of language that floats your boat. So I hope by the end of this video, you get to realize that actually English language A-level is a whole lot of a step forward from English GCSE. Okay, thank you very much and we will leave it there. Thank you.